Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Room for Discussion. In the last months and weeks, we have been bombarded by news regarding the current COVID pandemic. Sadly, we're here to talk about another global challenge, uh, namely drug trafficking. And we want to do it in a different way. We want to focus on the economic aspect of drug trafficking and go away from the typical stereotypes that Netflix series like Narcos portray. And to do this, we want to do it in basically two stages. The first one is one in which we want to address the components of drug trafficking, talking about consumers, producers. And later on, we want to address a more macroeconomic perspective of drug trafficking. So we're going to touch upon topics like money laundering. My name is Sovian, and I'm happy, blessed, and I'm very excited of sharing the stage with my friend Zoe over here. In order to tackle such a complex topic, we are very honored to have uh, Dr. John Collins here with us today. Dr. Collins was the executive director of, inter of uh, LSE's International Drug Policy Unit and the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Illicit Economies, and, uh, Illicit Economies and Development. His contemporary policy interests include the political economy of um, international drug control and the evolving dynamics of national and international drug policy reforms. So, um, Mr. Collins, thank you so much for joining us here today. Thank you, it's a pleasure. We are especially delighted because we know that you have such a busy schedule. You just started your new job as um, the Director of Academic Engagement at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. It sounds like a very, very impressive title, but we are wondering what does your job actually entail? Yeah, well, um, the Global Initiative is a, a network of 500 uh, experts on transnational organized crime from around the world and it has a, a, a standing secretariat of about 60 65 full-time staff as well um, so it's a huge huge body of expertise and, and knowledge on these topics and and really what my role is around is is serving as a bridge between academia and all of the expertise that's at GI so GI has very specialist knowledge on a lot of these topics um, and universities have a lot of um, capabilities and expertise as well on these topics. And, and my role is really to try bridge those two things. It's very interesting that you mentioned um, your function as a bridge, because actually when we were researching for this interview, we came across that a lot of the limitations that research has for drug trafficking is the lack of empirical data. Uh, you know, it's not like any other good that you can follow around with tax, with tax uh, you know, uh, <laughs> papers or anything. So we were just wondering, how, how do you tackle this limitation? Well, th there's ways, right? Exactly as you said. There's no, there's no accounting trails to follow. There is in the case of uh, illicit financial flows in some ways, but um, it, it, there is ways to measure the markets, right? You can do sample sizes of the markets. You can do purity estimates. You can, you can measure seizures and make extrapolations based on that about what you think is happening within the market. So overall, no, we don't have a really, really solid way of, of, of knowing what's going on in the market, but we have a good way of getting a, a sense of dynamics within the market. Um, whether it's through arrests or, as I said, seizure data or whatever it is. Um, and then we make extrapolations based on simple economic models, right? We know that drugs are not, you know, there was a time when we used to view them in these moral panic terms and they were, you know, something totally securitized and alien. But in reality, what we know is they're commodities like any other commodity, right? If there's a supply, if there's a demand, there's a supply. If there's a supply, there's a demand. Um, they respond to price changes. Some are more inelastic than others. There's a substitution effect between some drugs and others. Um, and so we just we, we can make assumptions and, 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 and estimates based on those kind of points. Do you think that you guys would like to have more support from the governments? Do you think you, the governments could provide more data to you? They could. They can. Um, data is it's very mixed. Some governments, I think, produce better data. Some governments pre produce pretty appalling data. I won't name any names, but um, <laughs> I was just and, about to and, ask. <laughs> No, and, and, and um, I, I think researchers have to be just aware of that and cognizant of that when they're using data. And, you know, we have international institutions which produce uh, reams of data on this as well. Uh, some of it may be more useful than others. Some of it may be a little bit more politicized than others. And we have to recognize as well, they're, they're operating within their own political constraints and, and their own institutional constraints. So I think that's where there is a real role for academia in this, is going out and trying to generate really new um, primary level research on a lot of these topics because sometimes the government data and the international institutions data just is, is quite lacking. Um, this question just pop up, pop up to my to my head when you're mentioning uh, when you're mentioning this this sort of like breaching function because 
hypothetically speaking, if I was a drug trafficker, right, I would be like, oh, Jesus, I want to know what these guys know about me, you know? Um, so have you ever thought, like, Jesus, maybe there's someone reading this, this that's going to use it for the wrong purposes? Possibly. Um, <laughs> I, I think, I frankly think in most cases they don't care, right? I think... I actually think there was a period where drug policies went into quite a kind of normative flux around 2015, 16. And I know colleagues uh, in civil society and others who, who were receiving death threats from, from people probably associated with uh, cartel activity. Um, but on the whole, cr criminal cartels profit from criminality, right? Um, they, uh, they don't, unless, unless they're operating com completely beneath the surface or they're um, uh, related to government and aren't overtly known to be involved in criminality, um, they're not really going to care what some academic is saying about them. Um, but there is a risk when you start getting into producing data or pointing fingers in areas where they don't want people to look. Um, and I know researchers do take that risk in, in, in some areas. But overall, I think generally just illicit markets operate. Um, and unless there's an existential threat to their existence or there's an immediate threat to their existence, they tend to, I just, I think they have other things to be doing than worrying about what academics are writing about. Them. Yeah, yeah. We're very happy to hear that at least personally you weren't um, affected by these considerations. Uh, now we would like to move on to the more substantive part of the interview and we would like to focus first on the players in the market because drug trafficking is a very complex issue, so maybe breaking it down to the players is going to help us simplify it. Starting with the consumers, um, what do you think uh, are the most relevant factors contributing to large-scale drug consumption? Well, it's, it, well firstly, the, it's an extraordinarily complex phenomenon, right? We, we try to distill it down into, at, at its most basic level, good and bad, legal and illegal, problematic consumption, non-problematic consumption. All of those are very limited labels for what is just a deeply complex phenomenon. You know, if we, we think of something that away from the drug market think of the alcohol market try to distill alcohol consumption for me into into you know a binary of good or bad it's it, it's it's an entire spectrum of activity it's an entire industry and, and 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 everybody has a different relationship to the substance um some people use it problematically because the, whatever reason whether it's um they're, they're they're trying to blank out some sort of psychological trauma or they're just having an inclination towards excess consumption or whatever it is um and some people will have a glass of wine every couple of weeks. Some people will have a glass of wine every night in a non-problematic way. You can you can think of something similar for drugs, right? Some drugs tend to tend to have uh, higher uh, higher senses of more people develop problematic associations with them. Yeah. But even then, if you think of something like uh, heroin versus tobacco, um, in, in a lot of metrics, tobacco is often seen as as addictive as heroin. If you look at the the, the difficulty in actually giving it up in a in a long term sense, so again, this starts to simplify. But it is the basic point of people are complicated, yeah. and people's relationships to substances are thereby also complicated. And it tends to distill it into it is evil or wrong to consume this drug over this drug or in this way over that way is just a very problematic way, I think, of thinking yeah. about this topic. Yeah, and you're describing all these individual level of factors that contribute to consumption. But I was also wondering, are there more societal, like these factors on the societal level that contribute to the differences we see in, in from one region to another? Of course, absolutely, right? It's, 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 a, rex, it's a form of reflexivity, right? If, if you're from uh, a, a very deprived background, if you're very poor educational attainment, if, you, if you're from a family situation which invoked a lot of trauma in your, in your formative years, you're far more likely to develop substance, substance abuse dependence issues. Um, and, and so we just have to recognize that. And as well, if you're from a wealthy family, you've got deeply ingrained cultural capital and social capital um, you're very unlikely to end up in a situation of, you know, being, you know, the, the, the archetypal image of the, the homeless person who is in some way drug dependent um, and, and their life spiraled because of drugs. It's just a flat out inaccuracy, right? That doesn't tend to happen people from uh, uh, wealthy, uh, well, cap socially capitalized backgrounds, right? That's, if you, if you think of that kind of archetype of a person, Probably uh, no social capital, very poor ed educational opportunities, psychological trauma as a child, those sorts of things. Those are the risk factors which create 
the conditions for somebody to become like that. And we, we, again, we, we prefer instead to say, oh, well, that's, that drug did that to them. Um, and, and that's just flatly inaccurate when you look at all of the social determinants around it. I think that um, now we're going to move on from the consumers to the producers, because as you mentioned, it's, very, it's almost an infinite kind of like discussion when it comes to seeing why people consume. But when we look at the market, right, we take a very simple glance at, at the transactions happening. We see that there is a crazy inflation in terms of the price. So just to contextualize a little bit for our audience and, and also for us, um, to produce a kilo of cocaine, for example, it's 600 in, in, in Colombia, right? And to sell that exact same kilo in the United States, it's 25,000, 26,000, around that. So that's almost 45 times the, the magnitude in terms of like that turnover from production costs to uh, revenue. So we were wondering, in your opinion, should we attribute this more to the mon monopolistic aspect of the market or more toward the illicit status of drug trafficking? Uh, I think it's the illicit status, right? The drugs are expensive because they're prohibited. Now, there's a debate about whether prohibition actually seriously reduces consumption. Um, I think a lot of sound economic analysis by people like John Corkins and others would, would, would argue that the simple act of prohibition makes these drugs, as you've highlighted, very expensive. You can't just put a, a kilo of cocaine in a FedEx package and ship it up the north of the, north of the border, right? Um, you, have to, you have to cross borders, which are highly securitized and in a lot of cases militarized. You have to have very strong political connections. You have to overcome a lot of obstacles. And so most of the the supernormal profits accrue to people who have those kind of political connections. So the street seller in Chicago or the, um, the grower in Colombia do not profit significantly from the trade. They earn, uh, they earn enough to survive in, in a lot of cases, as, as economics suggests, otherwise they'd leave the market. But really most of the profits accrue to those who can benefit and who have uh, a specialization in the illegality part of the market. So unquestionably, prohibition makes these drugs a lot more expensive. Um, yeah. You mentioned, you mentioned the, 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 the magic word, prohibition. <laughs> I think that it's a very interesting uh, concept the one you described, but there's also a part of them, right? There is also like a, a historical trade to this prohibitionist approach. Could you briefly define what this part of them is or the historical context of prohibition? No. <laughs> no. So a lot of my work uh, is, is about trying to actually uh, unpack the idea of prohibition. So I, I use the term quite loosely there. Okay. But actually, I think when I think of it as, as, as an international legal concept or as a national legal concept, um, it's, it's a double, it's a two sided coin. We tend to see again, we tend to want to see a dichotomy between legalization or regulation uh, and prohibition. The two are seen as fundamentally pro opposed concepts. The problem with that is um, prohibition involves regulation and re regulation involves prohibition. It's just about where you define the line, right? Um, you can get regulated diamorphine. It, that's not technically prohibited in a lot of places. That's heroin, right? But that's under a regulated circumstances that, that, are, that are permissible under the law in that uh, jurisdiction. Um, you can get cannabis under certain conditions, well, now very broad conditions, right? You go to California, you can get it legally, or Colorado, you can get it legally. Um, you go to other parts of the U.S., you can get it with a medical uh, with, with a medical indication. Um, so the idea that a, a drug is prohibited or not, I think, is is a, a, an idea that we need to move away from. We need to see this in terms of we're on a spectrum of regulation for all these drugs. In most cases, uh, or not in most cases, but in specific cases. The, the generality is that those drugs are regulated to the point of being effectively prohibited. Um, but that, that's not, that doesn't have to be this binary dichotomy. It can, we can move further along the spectrum. And I think that's where policy is most interesting at the moment, is moving along the spectrum towards more towards a kind of a softer regulation rather than a hard prohibition. Yeah, we'll dive more into the topic of prohibition later. But still on the, the topic of producers and on the high prices, um, we found a very interesting, maybe anomaly, that now we, we said that compared to the cost of production, the prices are ridiculously high. But if you put this in a historical context, the prices actually have been falling, at least the price of hard drugs have actually been falling a lot. So if we look at one example, uh, Coke, Coke shrank to 25% of its price during the 80s in the US and 40% since the 90s in the Europe. So what explains this price drop? 
that's that's a fundamentally good question, right? We, we there's been some analyses of what happened to cocaine prices over the over the 2000s. Um, I don't have an answer to it. I think it is just a case of um, we have to look at drug markets in their macroeconomic sense and the fact that they're relative to uh, uh, you know compounding inflation. They're relative to uh, the prices of other goods. They're relative to uh, other technological and, and economic factors which affect how, how it is to transship them to different areas. Yes. So um, I wouldn't give it a single causal factor. It's just it, you are correct that prices have, in, in a lot of cases, prices have been declining over time. Yeah. Is it perhaps something to do with the changing demographics as well? And that's a possible explanation, but I don't think even that alone would be that would be sufficient to explain it. Yeah. Uh, we have one last question on producers before we move on to macroeconomics, which is that we found a very interesting case study in Afghanistan, which showed that um, actually producers kept on harvesting opium, even though it was less profitable than harvesting normal vegetables. Hmm. What do you think could be at play here? Well, there's a variety of reasons. Opium is a store of wealth, right? So one is a cash crop and one is a, one is a food crop. Mm -hmm. So people grow cash crops when there's instability and insecurity. Um, food crops as well, even, even though the prices may be lower, getting it from farm gate to the market can be harder. Uh, it can be fraught with more risk. So if you want to develop a capital accumulation that you can potentially use in times of instability, you're going to grow a cash crop over a food crop, or you're at least going to mix the two. Um, and I think that's what we often find. And I think a lot of people have written about this. Um, you know, UNODC do a lot of work on this as well. It's, it's that um, uh, farmers are not necessarily just uh, making these decisions solely on price. They, uh, they, there is all sorts of other factors which determine uh, how they engage in the market. Do you see any particular social factor that could be defining? Because you mentioned the quality of, of, you know, the drugs being a sort of a currency, right? If you want to define the way, or at least that having that particular characteristic of a currency, which is, which is the store of value, but are there any other, any other social kind of like rules or, or, or norms that you see that, is, that are reinforced when it comes to producing uh, illegal drugs? No, well, absolutely. There, if, if we look in a historical sense, of course, right? If you think of how cannabis evolved uh, in, in India over the 18th and 19th centuries, right? It, it goes from this kind of religious, accepted in a religious context towards one which is, and, and, and this rejection of, of more potent substances um, towards as society changes and in some ways modernizes, then then some of those social mores start to break down and you see society trying to re-grapple with how it, how it regulates in an informal sense these substances. So I think there is always a socialization process around that and an informal regulation around it. Um, in somewhere like Colombia it's, it's, or, or Peru, it's, it's a lot more complicated. Um, and it's to do with the penetration of criminality into those areas or insurgent activities or, you know, the strength and resilience of communities. And um, that will often determine uh, how they interact with the market. So it's again, it's not just a price effect. Um, it, it has to do with all of these other factors as well. Perfect. Now, I think that we're going to move on to a more macro uh, approach to, to drug trafficking. And we're going to do that by first looking at the financial sector. So. Of course, um, if I was selling um, any kind of drug to you or to anyone here on, on, on the set at the setup, the transaction is not over after I give you the product. I get the money back, right? So mm. within that that uh, you know first stage, we wanted to know what are then the subcumbent steps in the money laundering process from drugs. Well, it's it's again, it's that we 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 have a, a, a desire to kind of see it as somebody launders the money, pulls it out of the financial system, washes it, and puts it back in. But in reality, a lot of the money laund money laundering happens just within the financial system. It's it's we we know of the most I won't name them, but we know of the most famous cases of banks effectively making it very 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 easy for for large amounts of cash to be washed through the system. Um, I know there's a great Brazilian researcher, um, Gabriel Faltran, he writes a lot about the used car market, oh, sorry, the stolen car market in Brazil. And if you look at the stolen car market in Brazil, it's effectively a way of washing the illicit financing from drug, the drug economy back into the mainstream economy through the insurance market. So we have all of these extremely complex mechanisms um, around mainstream finance, which are basically enabling a lot of these funds to re-enter the economy. They're designed specifically for that, maybe not consciously, but as the, you know, the market finds a way. And so you see the creation of these mechanisms which enable that. So um, 
money laundering, I wouldn't think of as something just a single process where, you know, you, you're a drug dealer, you approach a money launderer, he, he launders it for you, and then, then that's how it works. It's, it's, it's a complex, again, I'm saying the difference between regulation and prohibition is, is, is quite blurred, or it's, it's on a spectrum. Similarly, with the difference between licit finance and illicit finance, the two interact quite, quite significantly at many points along the way. I found it extremely interesting that you mentioned this because that's exactly what I found. I looked at the case studies and banks just get away with basically, even if not not fully intentionally, but being aware that they are contributing to money laundering and thereby to drug trafficking. So based on this, I was thinking maybe if we put stricter regulations personally on the bankers or like the, the heads of the department that might... Um, decrease drug trafficking? Do you think that's an option or would they just find another loophole? Uh, I, I once sat through a two hour uh, session of a day long conference, which was trying to define what illicit financial flows was. This was a group of experts around the world who, who work on this day in, day out for some, case, some cases, decades. No one could. We couldn't get to a consensus definition of what an illicit financial flow is. So actually, you know, at, at, a, at an abstract conceptual level, we know what an illicit financial flow is. But when you actually try to distill it down to a day-to-day, -day, tra what a transaction looks like that is part of an illicit financial flow, it becomes exceedingly difficult. And to raise, you know, it's like drug trafficking. Uh, enforcement around drug trafficking is not intended to knock out the market because it never will knock out the market. It's intended to raise the transaction costs. That's what we're talking about in illicit financial flows as well. You're trying to raise the, the transaction costs to make it a little bit more difficult and a little bit more risky for people to engage in that behavior. But the cost associated and the difficulty associated with raising that and the, the, then realistically the political barriers that you run into, right? You think of the city of London, you think of the idea of putting more financial regulation in place um, of what is already, frankly, quite burdensome regulation in some cases. Um, it's very difficult. And yeah. so I don't believe we can, I don't personally believe that we can envision a situation where through uh, very strict control of uh, financial markets, we can, we can smother the illicit drug trade. I think that's, it's going to be part of any strategy. When you're dealing with illegality, you have to target illegal, illegality. But it's, I think we have to be realistic about what it can achieve. And I don't see that having a, a substantial impact on global drug markets and in any foreseeable future. Yeah, it is def definitely difficult to define and really just compartmentalize illicit uh, finance. But there are some still very clear-cut cases. So we are going to um, name the banks. For example, Euro's biggest bank, HSBC, was um, had clear ties to Mexico's Sinaloa cartel. And they were aware that they were allowing more than $900 million to flow through drug trafficking through their banks. How, at this case, basically, they just settled out of court. Mm. Isn't this an example that shows that if we would need to hold personally the people much more liable? It, it, it's utterly shocking. Yeah. It, that's absolutely, un, you know, unequivocally. Um, and it's, it shows one rule for one and one rule for others, right? If you're, if you're a young black male in south side of Chicago or in, in the southern US and you get caught for selling a small amount of whatever it is, at some point marijuana, but it could be cocaine it could be anything you could you, you could end up at 25 years in prison some people end up with life in prison for that um uh, a bank which facilitates large transactions um by a a, a a cartel which is responsible for you know lots of uh, misery and slaughter in, not just in mexico um, and the fact that they can buy them way out of their way out of this, I think, if anything, it just shows the, the sheer hypocrisy of the idea of a war on drugs. There's a, there's a war on drugs which really applies to poor people and producer in uh, transit countries. And then there's a different kind of drug policy which applies to uh, wealthier consumers and also corporations, right? So, yeah. so the idea that a, a major bank could be part of this, something that is seen as so securitized and such a threat to national security, and just basically, by the way, out is obviously just, it, 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 it's really shocking. But I think anyone who works in drug policy, it's replete with these examples, right? When cocaine, when crack cocaine was an issue in the 1980s and it was associated with young black and Hispanic males, throw everyone in jail, who cares, lock them up, and then throw away the key, forget about them. When the latest opioid crisis in the United States affects middle-class white kids, um, we see a very different tone about how it should be approached. Yeah. Um, 
we need a public health approach we need we need care we need compassion which is exactly right that is what you need but it, it's it's only when it affects a different part of the population that you get that kind of different response yeah i think this also raised the question on how the hypocrisy between us um complaining about corruption in the so-called global south because the drug traffickers just pay off the authorities versus in the the west where they just get away and they just settle out of court without any any permanent uh, scars right so do you think there's even a difference between these two situations in what sense do you mean a difference because one of them is clearly labeled corruption and the other one is legal and we are not complaining about that so is there really a difference that justifies this this different um look we have on it well no if if, if you take the prohibitionist paradigm if you take the war on drugs at face value uh, uh, as, a, as a not very good us tv show said many years ago war on drugs is a war on drugs is a war on drugs and yet if you're completely ignoring it when it is wealthy white people in in big offices doing it well then that's a problem obviously by your own logic but we we know this right and as i said anyone who works in drug policy is that uh, the war on drugs is uh, a mechanism for is is often a very useful mechanism for state control of certain societal groups right um and it's 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 generally unwanted groups it's minority groups it's poorer groups that uh, drug policy just too often serves as a mechanism to impose some form of social control on and we see that again and again whether you look at um ma simple marijuana arrests in new york city up until quite recently um or uh, the targeting of certain farmers who grow coca or opium um that's just frankly how the war on drugs has always operated and perhaps contextualizing this discussion into what we're currently experiencing like corona basically sadly do you think that the fact that we have in to put a lot of the financial system under the loop to actually you know check for perhaps non performing loans in terms of banks or looking for uh vulnerabilities basically in the balance sheet of everyone do you think that this sort of like a uh, very specific scrutiny will actually help us tracking uh, this capital flows that you mentioned that were so difficult to to identify to begin with well we have to do it. and the, there's also there is a huge amount of legislation and and and, and anti money laundering uh legislation in places like the US which has nothing to do with the war on drugs it has to do with the war on terror and then the 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 kind of blurred line between often the war on drugs and the war on terror in a lot of places results in that in 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 a natural kind of expansion of anti money laundering into into that field so so we already do have a lot in that but let me give you some examples i knew somebody who was doing research on um on basically on banking right people who lose access to to licit banking individuals who lose access to licit banking because they're on a list of do not bank I, i don't know the i can't remember the actual terminology in the us but so there's large large numbers of people in latin america lose access to listed banking because their name is on a list you have no you have no way to determine why your name is on the list or to have it removed from the list it is just put on the list and you are therefore not eligible to be part of the banking system because you pose a threat for whatever reason you can just imagine all of the issues that that creates in terms of firstly it's it's it, there's no due process there there's no nothing around it. but then you think of the impacts on an individual and their family if they can't get access to illicit banking actually what you're doing is you're pushing them right in towards the illicit finance market so again and just like as we used to say well we need to go after the kingpins or we need to go after the sellers not the consumers um i think always we're going to find someone else in the in the war on drugs that that we can target and maybe by going after them we can we can we can win this fight the reality is a war on drugs is a systemically illogical uh pursuit now you can accept that and you can say well i think that a war uh, i think the prohibition is preferable to legalization even though i accept that it is a systemically illogical uh uh, uh pursuit or you can say well i i think we need to have systemic change now i'm not arguing for either side of this in in this discussion i'm just saying that's what we have to recognize and and i think actually the the zealous pursuit of enforcement has been some of the most problematic things we've seen emerge in the war on drugs so we can think of countries that still maintain prohibition but don't have a very a very aggressive prohibitionist policy don't lock up large amounts of people for simple drug offenses um uh versus those which pursue these deeply repressive in some cases using the death penalty and all sorts of really medieval methods of of countering drugs um so 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 that's just the reality i think we have to accept
it's very interesting because I was just tempted to ask you the question of which of which kind of countries are doing better, but I think then we fall into the, the whole problem you discussed at the beginning, right? We're using very simplistic labels. So instead, I want to ask you about um, perhaps a very interesting distinction I read in one article, which was that the regulators, in, in the sense of like bank regulators, are looking for making sure that everybody is following the rules and that they don't get a lot of you know problems in terms of people not getting access to credit or at least that, they, that everybody is under you know the rules so that they can make the transactions and keep their business going on the other hand the more legislative part wants wants to pursue and get the criminals you know so my question then would be do you think that this tension between these two groups can be reconcilable well, I, I would probably dispute the idea that the, the legislative wants to get the criminals. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, they want to get other criminals. Yeah. It's like, you know, it, if um, a, a drug use and drug dealing is something that others do until it becomes something that your family or your community or whatever it is has experience of. And then it becomes a very different story. So um, it's, it, it is this, not to get postmodern on it, but it is just a simple process of othering, right? And, 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 and transmitting the, the, the problem comes from elsewhere and we want to target it. Um, and, and it also then, when you do, when you do dehumanize the, the problem and you do uh, abstract it in that way, um, you, you miss all of the kind of economic and, and other incentives that people face that make their day-to-day -day decisions. So it's, it's you know, it's not all, it's not, solely that people get up one day and decide, actually, I'd, I'd like to make a lot more money to buy a fancy car. I'm going to become a drug trafficker. I'm going to become whatever it is. Um, people uh, are surrounded by situational conditions which determine a lot of their life trajectory, right? And recognizing, again, that systemic issue of uh, the war on drugs are, are, let's say, prohibitionist policies create the incentives that pull people towards these markets we have to recognize that right we've we've created a, a, an economic paradigm which incentivizes people to become part of these markets um, so even under prohibitionist paradigm we have to look at different methods of removing the economic logic and removing the all of these kind of other incentives that people face to become involved in the market rather than just saying let's label everybody who's involved in the market a criminal uh, and, and and let's say to throw them in jail or arrest them and you think so that's, that's I think, the think challenge that, we face. That's the role of legislators to put it back to perhaps to bring it back to the question. That should be the, the goal of legislators instead of like trying to get people catching people, you know, a gotcha moment. <laughs> yeah. And, and and it's a very difficult um it's a very difficult uh solution. It's there is no I think the more I study drug policy, the less I know about it, right? There is no actual solution to a lot of these problems, right? C Colombia could decide in the morning that it's going to legalize cocaine. Who cares? You still can't sell it across the border. You still can't transship it into the United States. Um, so a, a lot of the illegality is going to remain. Um, so so you, you, you can't just take these kind of unilateral actions. And again, a, a local jurisdiction may say, well, we want to, um, we want to remove criminal sanctions on, on certain activities, but that has an impact within a broader context of what are other jurisdictions doing? And, and what effect does that have on your community if you were the ones to, 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 to change? So yes, legislators have a role in this, um, but I think it's, it, it, it's not just legislators. When we look at the volume of the, of the amount of money that is being involved in, in drug trafficking, and also beyond that being laundered, the UN had a very impressive cipher in 2011, which was 1.5 of the global GDP. That sounds ridiculous if you think about money that is, um, you know, not uh, it's untrackable in a way or another, right? So we're wondering, where do you think, let's make this more precise, in which kind of assets is this 1.5 being concentrated? Okay, yeah, so 95% uh, of all statistics are made up, right? That's a relieving thought. Sorry? That's a relieving thought. Yeah. Um, so look, this is a useful number for coalescing global opinion and a sense of there is a there is a problem internationally that we need to to tackle. But the reality is we have no idea. We have no idea. Again, to go back to the point, we've no idea how to disentangle what is listed, what is illicit, what is gained from illicit markets and what is reinvested and, you know, capital accrued within listed markets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a figure. I have no idea if it's true, but I, I would be highly suspect about it. 
Um, we know it's a very large amount, right? Yeah. That's all we know, right? The, a huge, huge, huge part of global assets and, and, and financial flows are in some way derived from illicit activity. And it's, and it's not just black and white of I, I transship coca, cocaine across borders. It can be many, many things which, which blur the line between illicit and, and, and illicit. And the, uh, some of the activities touch whether it's human trafficking and, coke, and drugs or w- whether it's illegal fishing and drug smuggling and all these other things. So, yes, it's a very, very substantial part of the global economy and we have no real way of quantifying it. Um, but uh, disentangling it, I think, is just one of those issues that is similarly, sorry to be offering no answers, but is in some <laughs> ways similarly insoluble. No, but I think that that's a very clear um, picture of why this is so complex. I think that that by itself is the, is the only answer we have. But perhaps going beyond um, this very vertical conversation we have been having on like looking at different stages, you know, looking at consum- consumers, producers, um, launderers, a very interesting distinction then is a more perhaps horizontal comparison. And I think that you have been hinting at that by discussing the difference between countries. But now I want to make it a bit more explicit. So our question was, what do you think are the most um, terrible spillovers from developed economies into developing uh, economies when it comes to drug trafficking? Well, it's just the sheer corruption and illegality that's associated with the trade. Um, we know that, right? That that um, con- con- uh, producer transit countries are cost takers in in global drug policy in a large degree. Consumer countries are are cost exporters, right? If if producer and transit countries in the morning just said we're just going to let all of this cocaine or her- heroin or whatever it is flow through your borders, the assumption is that well, public health problems in consumer countries would increase because prices would uh, drop drastically and people would likely consume more. Now I know some people would challenge that assertion, but that is I think a reasonably consensus economic. Uh, assessment of what what we would see occur. So there is a massive displacement onto these poor producer and transit countries, which don't really get any benefits from it, right? Uh, It corrupts their economy. Okay, some people get very rich within their economies, um, but but it it corrupts their political institutions. It creates violence. They have to spend a lot of money on enforcement and, 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 and militarization. Um, so, so that's really, I think, the, the biggest uh, cost. You know, you think about it. Drugs became an existential crisis for the Colombian state. It is an existential issue for a lot of Central American political institutions. Um, you, you think of the sheer violence and the 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 the, the, uh, the, the daily uh, the, the daily homicide rate in, in in some in some of the favelas in Brazil as a result of the transshipment of cocaine through through Brazil. Um, that's that's I think that's the clearest cost of this. Yeah, it's very interesting that you highlighted violence so many times um, because there is obviously a, a very big correlation between drug trafficking and the amount of violence. But what we were maybe wondering is that what actually comes first? Is it political instability in these countries or is it um, drug trafficking? That's a very, very good question, <laughs> right? So um, it, it's... It, the circularity again, right? Uh, drug trafficking and illicit activities gravitate to areas with poor governance. Um, drug trafficking and illicit activities undermine governance. Which comes first? <laughs> God knows in most cases, right? It's it, it's it's a mixture of both. You need both yeah. can reinforce each other. Um, so I, I was recently writing an article on Colombia and looking at re- looking back again at some of the explanations of why Medellin became such a center of the global cocaine trade. And the reality is we don't have an answer. We have a couple of hypotheses, but the generally best an- answer is a lot of historical accidents came together mm-hmm. uh, and, and, and produced this outcome. So yes, an area in uh, that uh, geographically situated where it was and, and all of these other factors just brought together and, and maybe even idiosyncratic down to the individual entrepreneurs involved. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I, it, it's both. Yeah. Considering all these spillover effects that we talked about as a result of our current uh, prohibitionist paradigm, do you think that strict prohibition is a new form of colonialism or even so-called narco-colonialism? I think that's a very, very interesting question. And this is something I do write a lot about. I'm, I'm first and foremost a historian, so I wrote my PhD on the history of international drug control. Um, and I think it's, for all that I've been saying, I think that's too simplistic an answer. Um, it's too easy to just say, well, it was the United States as the global hegemon enforced this prohibition regime in its own interests around the world. 
because historically we know that's not actually an accurate narrative. Um, we know now that a lot of Central American governments and South American governments were advocates for, for prohibition, right? There was, um, uh, if you look at the work of Isaac Campos in Mexico, right? Mexico was a, was uh, actively pursued prohibition of can of marijuana at home, right? He wrote a book called Homegrown, highlighting that it was a homegrown phenomenon. If we look at, uh, James Windle has written about the origins of uh, a, a prohibition in Asia, right? So the early prohibitionist policies didn't come from the US, they came from China. Um, and, 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 and there was a, a very complex interplay between colonialism um, and, 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 and the onset of prohibition in Southeast Asia. Um, and, and I recently wrote an article uh, where, where I was making the point that, that, that actually a lot of the colonial powers were the anti-prohibitions um, and the anti-colonialists were the prohibitions, right? The United States saw itself as an anti-colonial power in Asia in the 1930s. It was pushing a hard, it was pushing a hard prohibitionist line in those areas. But a lot of the colonial powers in Europe were saying, well, look, you go there and try govern. You go there and try impose prohibition in the, in the, in the mountains of Burma. Um, it's not possible. It doesn't make sense. It's that we have to, in some way, try to regulate and control the trade. Yes, we want to minimize how many people are consuming, and we also recognize there's reputation issues around it. Yeah. So the relationship between colonialism and, and prohibition, therefore, becomes a little bit more difficult. Some of the most ardent prohibitionists after World War II were the anti-colonialists, were the post-colonial powers, um, because it was a sense of we're creating new societies, um, and so drugs, drug economies were part of the old colonial system, and therefore we need to completely expunge that from our economies uh, and move towards a new post, uh, post-drug post society. Um, so I, I, to reiterate the point, I think we, 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 we move into more less comfortable, more complex terrain when, when we begin that discussion. But I think drug policy is at a point now where we have to move into that kind of discussion because that's only how we can really begin to under, unpick the economic fundamentals of the economy yeah yeah perhaps the word narco-colonialism was a bit of a push but um they, i think it is undeniable that there's a lot of spillovers from developed to developing countries so really looking yeah. at those do you think that money transfers would be a good solution to compensate for a damage done or would you suggest another way of compensation Yes, with money transfers come conditionalities. So there is money transfers. And the, the idea of shared responsibility dates back to the 80s um, and, and was solidified in 1998 by the United Nations. So shared responsibility is an international principle that the UN supports. And under that shared responsibility, consumer states are supposed to pay the costs of enforcing these drug now, That's the issue, right? They pay the cost of enforcing these drug policies. So in the United States sense, uh, some of that is linked to development policies, but those development policies have traditionally had a huge degree of conditionality. And what I mean by that is if you if you're going to pay a community not to grow coca only by not growing coca, will they will they receive the are they entitled to the funding or the support? Right. Again, the problem with that is a lot of these communities can only financially sustain themselves through coca and the transition away from that is a long term development issue. Whereas if you look at countries like Germany or, or other parts of Europe, they have used the idea of um, shared responsibility as effectively um, development. They call it alternative development, but it is our focus is on developing communities and the, the uh, reduction in drug crops will come later. Again, the problem with that is you're viewing everything in drug crop terms. Instead of seeing it as a development issue, you're seeing you, you, you often, and now they would reject this, and I think it's in some cases it's unfair to say this, but often it creates the paradigm of just reinforcing the sense of all of our policies regarding these communities are around this single crop that they're involved in, rather than doing a holistic development policy. So I think, of course, there is a responsibility on the West to to or in and the global north to to pay for the costs of some of these policies, but again, with that comes the sense, comes the interference. That comes the US wants to pay for a nice new military base or a nice new police station. It doesn't necessarily want to pay some of the other costs. You mentioned very interestingly, I think, that two questions ago, the fact that if all of a sudden Colombia, you know, people in Colombia were to wake up and say, let's make it legal, that would still not be enough because you still have an illicit sort of like, uh, you know, process still when it comes to trafficking it or like to sell it in other countries. So that for me, it was very interesting to listen uh, to that to the explanation of yours in the context of that sort of um, you know spectrum between prohibition and legalization. So, my question to you is then, what can actually then legalization fix? 
Well, the, but that's that's a good question, and I, you know, I know a lot of advocates who who think that we have to, whatever, warts and all, legalization is the only solution to drug policy. Um, but the reality is, if we look at the several hundred thousand Colombian uh, house, uh, uh, pe people in rural areas of Colombia uh, reliant on uh, illicit coca cultivation or coca cultivation, if you legalize in the morning. Uh, the industry consolidates very quickly, moves into some areas, moves onto a mass production scale, probably far more uh, capital rather than labor intensive, and all of those people are out of a job. So all of those communities certainly will starve because they have lost the access to the, or they'll switch into other illicit activities or whatever it is. So we've seen it in Mexico where the legalized cannabis market up north, uh, you lose access, you lose your competitive advantage in growing cannabis in Mexico. So they switch to opium or else the, the levels of criminality in those areas skyrockets or whatever it is. Um, so we don't really have, uh, we, we don't really have a sense of legalization will actually help those communities in the very immediate term it will remove unquestionably a lot of the illegality around the illicit drug economy now what we also know is that will probably displace into other forms of illicit economy um but i don't think necessarily in the immediate term it's it's whether it whether it's a conceptually sound idea in the immediate term it's just not a realistic one because of what you've just said right colombia can grow all the cocaine it wants legally but it can't sell it across borders and there's no internet there's no a uh, realistic sense of uh, it would have a, uh, have a right to send it up to the U.S. border if the U.S. is not willing to let it in. It's just not yeah. possible. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Uh, another um, drawback, possibly, for legalization we found is that it actually just wouldn't work for certain type of countries like Mexico and Colombia because it would generate violent responses from drug cartels. So the government couldn't reinvest the, the, the security spendings into um, social welfare. What type of approach do you suggest these countries should follow? Yeah, well, and that's that that is the problem is that you're you're kind of in this catch-22 situation that uh, yeah, I think drug cartels would be very unlikely to allow a situation where the competitive advantage is removed overnight. Now, they have diversified in recent years. We've seen that, but they, they've always been diversified, but they've particularly diversified into in, in recent years. Um so this is where we get into the the case of you can't legalize unilaterally. Uh, you can't win a war on drugs. So what do you do? And that's when you start getting into discussions around strategic enforcement around, well, okay, let's, what does a more reasonable implementation of the current paradigm look like? Yeah. Um, and I think that's, that's sort of where you by default end up in these discussions. So you think that even though um, there's a right approach, which is quite different for each country or each region, there is still a possibility of international cooperation? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm. That's certainly what I would argue. Many would disagree with it, um, but my, you know, there's many who who think we need a radical systemic change of the international control system, and only by exposing the inherent and contradictions within it will we ever see that. My view is we need to have a more pluralist, flexible approach in the short term, because then we'll start to see experimentation. We'll start to see we'll start to see examples of things that do work, and then those will be mimicked and and, and transmitted across borders. Um, and we can start to see a kind of momentum towards new policies. Yeah. So if we think of the case of coca, you're not going to see a legalized cocaine market, but you could see a more developed coca market that's not going to soak up all of the coca that goes into cocaine manufacturing because you know how much coca is required per kilo of cocaine. But it's still, <laughs> excuse me, it's still a licit alternative to an illicit economy for people who are growing coca and it's worth exploring that in the least so you can imagine a regional traded market around coca leaf as as a potentially viable way to start establishing illicit routes that could potentially serve as an alternate to the illicit economy yeah so far it's really it seems like what you're suggesting is some form of um, compromise between regulation and legalization but there's another spillover effect of prohibition that um, we wanted to dive into a tiny bit, uh, which is the environmental damage. Because mm. prohibitionist policies uh, hurt the environment, especially through er eradicating crops and spraying the fields without um, uh, selection. So do you think legalization would actually help on this problem? Uh, I, I Look, in the case of uh, drug prohibition, uh, in so many cases, the cure is worse than disease, right? Going in and spraying glyphosate into the Colombian rainforest is, is nuts, in my view. 
Um, it's it's not just not it's immoral. It's it's you know it's a humanitarian disaster. So stopping doing all of that really stupid policy interventions um, is 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 a positive in my view. Um, so I think in, in that case, and also let's 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 abstract and let's avoid me saying whether it's a good or bad, right? Let's just imagine an archetype legalized scenario where the cocaine market suddenly is legalized in Colombia. It 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 becomes more concentrated. It's more capital intensive. Um, so you're not seeing thousands of hectares burned down in rainforest or protected areas uh, every year to to expand coca production or to whatever it is so naturally the environmental footprint is going to decrease right illicit illicit economies have a very very outsized environmental footprint so if we know let's let's step away from the legalization question if we know that prohibitionist policies are causing environmental damage and are having very minimal effects in reducing supply well then just moving away from those kind of repressive pointless policies is, I think, a win, and, and, and we should be moving in that direction. Yeah. And to go to, to, to just go to your point about, you know, what I'm advocating, I think incremental, incremental, an incrementalist approach is, a pragmatic incrementalist approach is, in my view, the only way to deal with this issue. I know many would like to see radical change overnight, but as we've said, the compl complexity around that, you know, people advocating legalization because it will help the farmers except for the fact that the sub farmers would lose their livelihoods overnight is, you know, we have to be very careful about really radical change in policy. So I think we are, we have a massive natural experiment underway with cannabis legalization, um, which, uh, which will give us, this is the first experiment we've had with moving from a large scale illicit economy to a partially legalized economy in certain areas. We're going to have a huge amount of data around that. We're going to learn a lot around that. Countries will decide whether to mimic or to reject that based on the experiences they see. Um, and that ultimately then can inform Mark's approaches to other potentially illicit drug markets. But the idea of going from a hardcore war on drugs on every front, uh, you know, a decade ago to let's just legalize everything overnight and let's change the entire time overnight i don't see as workable or as necessarily the best outcome so it's very interesting because now we've been we have been anchoring ourselves to the coca example but if you think also about more industrialized kind of drugs for example more like uh, synthetic drugs um we see that especially for example in the netherlands you have they are the largest producer of ecstasy if i'm not mistaken and also M, 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 yeah. MDMA. mdma exactly um, and that also produces a lot of uh, damages for the environment. You see people spilling over a lot of the chemical waste, you know, outside, yeah. uh, in, a, in very informal ways into rivers, into canals and everything. So my question would be like, is there, is there an advantage in terms of, of developing countries and developing countries when it comes to being able to re legislate in a way that is environmentally uh, sustainable when it comes to making sure that we have legal drugs then for example well well you know on a conceptual level absolute prohibition or absolute implementation of prohibition in many ways just gives over regulation of the market to illicit actors and that's sort of yeah you, the state has surrendered any ability to actually regulate it because it, it it's effectively said it's illegal and if it continues then the state has no control over it and that's where you see so how if the state's view of this market is <laughs> it's illegal we, we, we do not want it to exist and our, our, our object is knocking it out. How can you say, well, but also our object is making sure that drug producers are act, acting in an environmentally friendly way and aren't pouring chem, massive chemicals down the drain? It's, it's, these are in many ways illogical and contradictory viewpoints. And so that's where you get this situation where we know all of these negative aspects associated with prohibition and, and these markets, but we can't address them because we have a solely prohibitionist focus on it. Do you think that the current UN conventions allow for an environmentally sustainable international drug policy, or would we need to um, have new legislation? Right. Again, I, um, there is many people who differ with me, some vigorously differ with me on this, but let me, let me offer my opinion. We will not, in any foreseeable future, renegotiate the UN Convention on Drugs. Not a possibility, not going to happen, not in the next 40, 50 years, in my view. Um, you may see a, a very minor legal adjustment of them, but even then, I think that's highly doubtful. We couldn't even re agree, a, 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 or a, well, we couldn't agree a consensus redefinition on cannabis and, and, and its position on the conventions when countries are actively legalizing, right? 
this is a highly divergent issue with you've got on the one side you've got the philippines you've got russia you've got egypt you've got others on the other side you've got you know portugal switzerland whatever you want vastly or the us or jamaica vastly different approaches so the, we're not going to be renegotiating the un conventions in any foreseeable future but i think we've reached a point where there is quite a degree of flexibility and the idea that they serve as a hindrance to national policy change is just wrong at this point because we can see that cannabis legalization is happening regardless of the un convention now people might say that's a serious legal problem and we have to address it and we have to we have to we have to resolve these inherent legal tensions within the un treaty system around drugs but the reality in my view is the system will just evolve around that and within within a decade this won't even be seen as a, a particularly contentious point it will just be we have reached a more flexible approach on cannabis and we have a more we have a different way that we interpret it um, and that's that's just going to be the reality. Um, the idea that countries have to do environmentally damaging policies because of the drug conventions is nonsense, in my view. There's lots of the, we have the we have lots of tensions and contradictions within international law, but that doesn't mean that countries should do counterproductive and damaging policies just to pursue the letter of the law of one specific internet set of international treaties. Right? We could think of we could think of many other areas where we'd see the absolute absurdity of that idea. So if countries are doing very damaging environmental policies because of the war on drugs. I don't think it has anything to do with the UN treaty system. I think it has to do with their own internal political economy or else whatever funding they're relying on from external actors. Um, but the, but I, I think moving away from that, what, what would the UN do? What could it do to countries that were legalizing cannabis? Yeah, so we have discussed a lot of, talking, a lot of topics during this interview. I think it's been very interesting and I've learned a lot. Me too. So it's been, it's been very, very nice, very interesting. The only, the only, the only perhaps negative part is that we heard a lot of, uh, you know, answers and discussions in in the line of like, oh, we cannot solve that. We haven't been able to solve it since that time, you know. And I imagine that for you, it could be very frustrating because I imagine that you're working very hard on this every day. So my question to you is, what actually keeps you motivating into researching <laughs> <laughs> this, knowing that perhaps it, it might not be solved in our life lifespan? Well, um, as, as some, all right, if, 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 if I put my pragmatist cap on, right, I, <laughs> I, when I started in drug policy in 2000, and it would have been about 2007, 2008, um, we were, this was a very different world. Um, the idea of questioning the war on drugs was not something that was even feasible at, at high level political opinion, right? The idea of questioning continued ma marijuana prohibition, if you were sitting U.S. congressman or senator, um, impossible virtually, you know, there were, there was the odd uh, senior politician nationally in the U.S. Who, who would who would make these kind of utterances, but really, there was one way to deal with this. We are now looking at a situation where, just to give the cannabis example, um, the a Biden administration looks likely to, in some way, rectify federal law around this. Right? That's how breathtakingly quickly that has moved. We didn't foresee that five or ten years ago. Sorry, it happened in 2012. We didn't see it ten years ago, um, and so I, I, the the simple fact of not having this unit kind of consensus paradigm of pursuing this aggressive war on drugs which was obviously so counterproductive which was obviously locking up so many citizens needlessly um, just moving away from that towards trying to find more pragmatic responses is i think a policy victory and is something i think to keep motivated around the fact that we don't have good answers yet well that's yeah that's the long durée of this right we we have to see a kind of long-term experimentation we have to be modest in, in, in our uh, you know yeah uh, i know i know your your background is central banking right like we need to be modest about what predictions we make yeah um, because uh, we're, we're always wrong humans humans <laughs> are generally always wrong right occasionally we get it right but but i think having that modesty approaching a topic like this is that that's probably the way to move it forward thank you thank you very much mr collins i think that it's been lovely to have you as a guest we have learned a lot as i just mentioned um, before we finish our transmission, I wanted to make a quick uh, quick announcement. So we're going to have uh, this week, it's a busy week for Room for Discussion, we're going to have two interviews coming on Thursday, one with uh, former IMF uh, chief economist Olivier Blanchard, and the second one with uh, it was going to be a panel discussion on the future on, of the economy and politics within this COVID reality with uh, Ferguson and uh, Mr. Han Jong Chang. So, Big guest, uh, very interesting conversation. Conversation, and to end up, I, I just wanted to make a very uh, clear uh, 
uh, and friendly reminder of, of, of how grateful we are from, from the part of their RSD team. We have been working really hard during this COVID time, but uh, usually uh, what really keeps us mot motivated and going is your support. So make sure to go to those uh, events, like them, see them, watch them, because the reason we can get this kind of guest is because of you. So thank you very much, Mr. Collins, for being one of those wonderful guests. Thank you so and, much. Uh, contributing and contributing to guys. contributing to this platform. I think that uh, we're all very happy to be part of it. So yeah. muchas gracias and pura vida. Thank you. Pleasure.